Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. Hello, I'm James Wilson. After years of resisting the move, America's military has joined the war on drug trafficking. Defense secretaries in the 1980s fought hard to keep the armed forces out of drug interdiction efforts. They were acting in accord with a long-held national belief that the military shouldn't take part in domestic law enforcement matters. But with the nation's concern about drugs reaching a fever pitch and a new administration in place, the military changed course. The armed forces now are helping in attempt to stop the flow of drugs across our borders. They do so in several ways. By providing surveillance of air traffic along smuggling routes, by providing seaborne eyes and ears that seek out suspicious vessels and assist the Coast Guard in searches, and by helping the Customs Service at border crossings. These men and women are members of the Texas National Guard. After an hour of calisthenics, they'll be on their way to the United States Port of Entry in El Paso, Texas. Since 1989, approximately 60 of them have been assigned to work alongside customs inspectors trying to interdict the flow of drugs from Mexico to the United States. They work with the customs officers in the uh, area of cargo examinations and commercial vehicle examinations. Uh, we examine the empty trucks as they come into our compound with the guard. We use the guard uh, along with our officers to break down the cargo that's in the trucks and verify the contents of the, uh, the manifested cargo. They also deploy with our officers to other locations where we examine uh, commercial aircraft, air freight, and um, the railroad that uh, crosses daily from Juarez. The Guard spends most of its time methodically inspecting commercial vehicles that customs inspectors target as suspicious. The reason that this truck was selected is because uh, it's a little abnormal other than the rest of them. You have to empty it completely to get to the front of the truck. Our interest right now is not necessarily only the melons, but the container itself. It's coming from the interior, straight from the interior of Mexico. It took most of a day for several National Guardsmen to comb through this one melon truck. Each box, after it was removed, was x-rayed individually. Basically what we do is we get in the cabs and look around, poke, poke around on the tires and the gas tanks and so forth because these people can hide that stuff anywhere. There's about a hundred places on one of these diesels you can put the drugs. And we'll try to look at all of them. And we do that for eight hours a day. Six days a week, sometimes seven if they need us. We do need more National Guardsmen. I mean, that's a big plus for, especially here in the Port of El Paso. It's so busy that you've only got so many inspectors and we're always short-handed that the more the merrier. Customs inspectors say they welcome all the help they can get. Stopping the flow of drugs along the 1,000-mile border Texas shares with Mexico is an awesome task. This border crossing is one of the busiest in the Southwest. On a typical day, approximately 47,000 cars and 1,600 trucks cross the Rio Grande River from the Mexican city of Juarez into El Paso. The Guard has made a big difference in the number of commercial vehicles they've been able to inspect. I think that the Guard has been very beneficial to our efforts down here in El Paso. Um, while we're restricted in utilizing them to just cargo examinations, we have been able to significantly raise the amount of cargo that we look at. Um, approximately, we've gone from about a 5% examine rate 
up to uh, about a 37% examination rate, and we could not have achieved that without the assistance of the Guard. All of the National Guard involved in the drug searches are volunteers. Although they do not want their identities revealed, they say they are proud of what they are doing. The reason why I'm here is I want to try at least to stem some of the drugs coming into this country. I've seen what it can do to people. So I'm going to try to do my job to stop it. You feel great when you find something. It's accomplishing. It's keeping a drug from getting to, to, uh, to your sons, to someone else's sons, to their daughters. It's a good feeling. It's rewarding to know that you've stopped it here before it's had it distributed somewhere else. The National Guard has had an impact on the amount of narcotics that we've seized here in El Paso, although it's been a subtle one. We haven't, uh, with their assistance, really found any major uh, loads of narcotics in our cargo area, but we feel that with our heightened intensity of examinations, we've driven the smugglers from using cargo shipments to using private vehicles, and instead of uh, coming across the border with one truck with, uh, say, 10,000 pounds of marijuana, they're shotgunning smaller amounts of marijuana in the, in the range of 150 to 300 pounds that are concealed in private vehicles through our bridges. This room contains nothing but marijuana that has been seized in the past year or so. And we keep it here until we get the disposition order to destroy it. So far this year, 14 tons of marijuana and more than 8 tons of cocaine have been seized. Still, customs inspectors don't know if they're having any real effect on the drug trade. As far as trying to determine the amount that actually gets across the border and into um, the interior of the United States, that's very difficult. Uh, one of the ways we like to see what our impact is is to see what the current price of the drugs is uh, the drugs are uh, on the streets of America and uh, despite the record seizures we've made all across the country uh, we really haven't seen that that much of a price drop for any of the contraband as for the Texas National Guard in El Paso they say they're ready and willing to do more I think the military needs to jump in full guns on this because it's a, it's a growing problem. It's getting larger every day. And if we could get a lot more military support, I think a lot more could be done. Really do. I think the military should be more involved. We've got the resources to do it. We've got sophisticated listening equipment. We've got sophisticated optical equipment. We've got helicopters. We've got vehicles that can cross country that some of these RVs and stuff that, that Border Patrol has can't make it to. And we've got the manpower. Why can't we do it as part of our maneuvers or something else? No reason why we shouldn't be able to. With me to discuss these matters are Michael Wormuth, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Drug Enforcement Policy, and Peter Reuter, Senior Economist at the RAND Corporation. Secretary Wormuth, uh, the, the uh, Secretary of Defense has stated that he wants the Department of Defense to attack drugs at the source country in transit from the source country and at the border when it enters the source country. What exactly has Congress authorized the DOD to do? Well, in 1988, in the fall of 88, Congress directed the Department of Defense to take on three major new missions in counter-narcotics. First, to serve as the single lead agency of the federal government for aerial and maritime monitoring and detection of the illegal transit of drugs in the United States. Secondly, to integrate the command, control, communications, and technical intelligence assets of the federal government into an effective communications network, basically to get everybody talking to each other on the same types of radios and other equipment. And finally, to expand and enhance the role of the National Guard operating in a state status under the control of the various state governors to help federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Many American people would say this step was long overdue. What was the reason why there was skepticism or resistance in the Defense Department before these new initiatives? Jim, I think that there were reasonable beliefs, uh, good faith intentions on the part of both the policymakers and the military leaders, a very strongly held belief that to involve the military in an activity like this might very well take away from the preparedness of the military to do other critical national security missions. 
uh, that belief was held, excuse me, was held for a long time in, in prior administrations. Uh, again, probably with the best of intentions, uh, it has proven not to be the case as the military has become more involved in, in the counter-narcotics This effort. is not seen now as contradictory to maintaining general preparedness for other military missions. No, as a matter of fact, a lot of the things that the military is doing now is, is good training, realistic training. Uh, in a lot of different areas, there are military commanders all over the world who are saying, reporting back through their channels, that the things that soldiers and sailors and airmen are doing actually contributes to readiness and to training rather than being a detractor from There was also a concern that uh, the military might become involved in domestic law enforcement in a way that would run afoul of something called the Posse Comitatus Act passed in 1878. Tell us briefly what that act was all about. Well, the Posse Comitatus Act basically was a response to some of the things that were going on in that time. For instance, the lawlessness in the West and the propensity of people, of local law enforcement in the West to call out the cavalry. Uh, the law was passed and basically said that no one can direct the military services to enforce the laws of the United States. And there's other statutory language that, that more clearly defines what that means and says that the military can't be used in searches, seizures, arrest, or other similar activity. So it's the purely law enforcement, the real law enforcement effort, arresting people, searching people, seizing things that belong to people, that posse comitatus and related statutory language is intended Now, have those to, laws been changed, or are they still, in fact, governed? No, they're still very much in force. Uh, and the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Cheney, has made it clear that he uh, does not intend to seek any major modification to posse comitatus. So the D Defense Department today, though more actively involved in the drug uh, interdiction effort, is not arresting people, is not itself making searches. That's correct. Clearly still within the confines of posse comitatus. Now let's go through the three things that uh, you mentioned that the Defense Department is trying to do. First of all, detection of air and sea traffic. Uh, how can you do this when there are, at any given time, hundreds of ships at sea, hundreds of planes in the air approaching the United States? How do you know what is a drug-carrying plane or ship and which is not? Well, as you can imagine, intelligence is a key to almost everything that we do and everything that we do in cooperation and association with the law enforcement agencies. You know, our role, even in the monitoring detection mission, is to support law enforcement in the tail end of the interdiction process, and that's the arrest, search, and seizure. So from intelligence from a lot of different sources, we try to direct assets, airborne radar assets or seaborne assets, to places where we have determined from experience are the, the corridors that the traffickers are using, or in, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, certainly in, in recent months, where we now have gained intelligence to be able to direct assets to particular spots, whether it's in the Caribbean or closer to our own borders, where we have good reason to believe that traffickers okay. are we'll, actually proceeding. We'll come back to this in a minute to find out how well this is working. Let me turn now to Peter Reuter. Dr. Reuter, uh, the military's role here is an effort to improve our interdiction, that is to say, to reduce the amount of drugs coming in to our borders. Uh, how well do you think, in principle, the military can improve that effort? Does interdiction make a difference, even if well performed? I, th I think interdiction is inherently a very limited instrument against a drug like cocaine, which is very compact uh, per unit value. I mean, the amount of cocaine that is used in this country can be imported annually in probably two cargo planes. Uh, interdiction against a drug like marijuana, which is relatively bulky, can be effective at least in keeping foreign marijuana out. Our problem with marijuana is, is more keeping uh, production in, inside this country down. But I think that interdiction against cocaine is inherently very limited, in part because when the drug enters this country, it's very cheap, so that um, it sells for in Miami for probably $15,000 a kilogram. Uh, when the smuggler sells it to the uh, importer, it sells on the street for maybe almost 10 times that. You can lose a lot of cocaine at the border 
before you have a big effect on the price of cocaine in the U.S. Let me make sure I understand this. It would seem to me, perhaps because I have operated a more limited budget, that if somebody took away from me on a regular basis items that were worth $15,000 per kilogram, uh, that I would feel that pinch. And even though I, they might not be taking away all of my livelihood, they would be taking away enough of it so that it would make a difference in how I chose to spend my life. That doesn't occur in your view. Well, it, look, Interdiction is sort of like a taxing system. That is, we take away 10%, 20%, 30% of all the cocaine that enters this country. And it's like a 10, 20, 30% tax uh, on smugglers at this stage. The question is, can they pass that tax along without greatly increasing the price at the retail level and hence reducing consumption in this country? And the and answer to that question and is? The answer, the answer to that question is uh, no. Uh, it's very hard to raise the tax rate to such a level that you can really make a difference to the retail price in this country and hence reduce consumption. Would you then favor saving money, eliminating interdiction efforts, and spending our money on something else instead? No, the, the question is not whether interdiction should be zero or should be everything. The question is how much should we spend on interdiction in the total budget? And I would say now that, that interdiction is getting less of the federal uh, drug budget, and that's probably appropriate. And I think more, uh, more narrowly with respect to the topic today, the question is what role can the military play I mean, the military have some special assets that seem very relevant to interdiction. They have certain kinds of technologies. They have an organization that has certain kinds of training, etc. And the question is, are there ways in which we can use those assets to support uh, what is the, the, the interdiction effort that will inevitably primarily be in the hands of civilian agencies like the Customs Service? Well, let's suppose we use the military in other ways. They have technical assets, but they also have a great deal of manpower. Some Americans who are so frustrated with the drug problem facing this country wonder out loud why we don't send the military to Peru or Bolivia or Colombia and, and quote, clean up the mess, unquote. Well, I think that there is a, a, a proper concern about interfering in the domestic affairs of that nation. Now, it's true they're exporting something to us that causes us a great deal of trouble, but our ability to, to go in and sort of reconstruct the government of Peru, so, whether with military means or otherwise, so that it can effectively administer its territories is inevitably very limited. And I think that there is a real reluctance on the part of of uh, thinking people to, to do that. Now, you said something interesting a moment ago. You said that the federal government has reduced the share of its money mm -hmm. on drug programs going to interdiction. Uh, where has it taken the savings and put them? Well, the, the drug budget has expanded enormously mm -hmm. over the last two years. It's probably almost doubled uh, in that time period. So interdiction, the amount of money going to interdiction, particularly the amount of money going to interdiction under the military budget has gone up substantially. But when you look at it as a share of what the federal government is spending on uh, controlling the drug problem in this country, the interdiction share has actually started to go down during the 80s. It was going, through most of the 80s, it was going up substantially. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Peter here is uh, uh, skeptical that the, uh, even adding the military's resources to interdiction will make a big difference in the amount of cocaine available on the streets of America. Do you agree? Well, Secretary Cheney has said that interdiction alone is not going to solve the problem, that it has to be a combined effort. It has to be education, prevention, treatment, all of the combined efforts of all of the federal agencies on both the supply and the demand side. It has to, to be community-based efforts, local efforts, state efforts, and federal efforts. Interdiction alone will not solve the problem, but we believe that you can't solve the problem without interdiction. You simply can't stop doing interdiction because you think that it may not be effective. And, you know, we really haven't yet gotten to the point where we are doing the most effective job, perhaps, that we can do in the interdiction effort. As the, the Defense Department and all of the other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies are learning to work more closely together, we're already starting to see that we're making some inroads. It's going to take some time. It's not going to happen in two months or six months, perhaps not even in two years or six years. You know, the President's National Drug Control Strategy that was, uh, that was released in September of 1989 has as a goal to reduce drug abuse by 50 percent over 10 years. Now, maybe the American people don't want to hear 50 percent over 10 years, but it is, in fact, a long-term problem. It's not going to go away overnight. Let me just press you on this for a moment, if I can. We've had interdiction efforts, albeit at a less uh, emphatic level in the past, and yet if we look over the last 10 or 15 years, the statistics seem to show that the street price and purity of cocaine 
uh, has remained unchanged. That is to say, the price has been low or even become lower, the purity has been good or even become better, suggesting that this tax that Peter Reuter says is the effect of interdiction on the drug supply, this tax hasn't taxed anybody out of business or even hurt them. So if that's the case, and I don't know whether it is the case, then should we be spending any effort on interdiction? Well, we are being, we are becoming more effective every day. I don't know that you can always measure something in terms of the street price. Certainly over a long period of time, that's probably one measurement to use. But there are a lot of resources being devoted to this problem that really have just started being devoted to it. And I, I really don't think we've had the time to see whether or not we're really affecting the price because cocaine, it's only in the last three or four years that it's really gotten to be the number one drug problem. And we're now learning how to go after it in source countries, and a lot of those countries down there are trying very hard to attack the problem. And we're getting better approaching our borders on the high seas and in the air, and we're getting better at the borders themselves. Well, so we'll we just got to give it some time. We'll come back in a moment and talk about some of these source country efforts, but let, let me first ask Peter Reuter, crack cocaine is abundantly available. Uh, do you think that interdiction has, can make, even if we step up our resources, uh, much of a dent in the availability of crack cocaine? No, I really do not think that interdiction, if we, if we were to say double the interdiction budget over the next couple of years, I do not think that would make a substantial difference. The American public would find that uh, very grim news because they like to believe this battle can be fought totally at our borders or outside of the country. I, no, it, 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 it is, uh, I, mean, I think source country programs are even more appealing to Americans precisely because it sort of has that fundamental sense we'll stop them growing it and that that's the problem well, what about the next country? best okay uh, source country programs I I must say I think uh, uh, you know have even less prospect of making a difference and you're so, saying that if we somehow train local police and military forces to to get at the coke labs and that we s provide subsidies for farmers to go out of the coca raising business and grow something else is that that this will not have any effect even though it's directed right at the source Again, I think you have to talk, look at prices to sort of understand the inherent limitations of this. The, the, the coca leaf that goes into a kilo of cocaine costs less than $1,000, maybe only $500 uh, in Bolivia or Peru. Even if we sort of make it so that, that uh, peasant farmers are at risk of losing their crop because the police come around and eradicate or spray them, for, so that we force them to go into smaller areas, more camouflage, so they become higher cost producers, we just we can't raise the leaf price enough that it makes much of a difference here. And we sort of have some notion of the of the the uh, how far we can get through these source country programs by looking at Mexico. Mexico is compared to Peru or Bolivia, a relatively wealthy country, well governed, etc. There's a great deal of corruption in the in this uh, in their drug control program, but they have a very severe. I mean, they, they have been very stringent in their efforts to eradicate drugs, uh, eradicate uh, marijuana and, and opium production, and yet, by 1989, they were producing record amounts of both uh, marijuana and, and opium. I think there's, it's an inherently eradication, even crop substitution programs are inherently very limited uh, programs. Mr. Secretary, your views on this. Um the Secretary of Defense stated that moving to the source country was one of the missions he wanted the Defense Department to, to take under uh, advisement and to pursue. What does a source country mission mean from the point of view of the Defense Department? What can you do in a source country? Well, from the Department of Defense standpoint, and of course this again is, is a combined effort of a number of federal agencies and includes things like crop subsidies and economic assistance. But from purely the Department of Defense standpoint, we can go in with a lot of expertise and not engage in the actual operations. We don't use U.S. military forces to go out on drug eradication operations or lab seizures or things like that. But we do help them plan those operations. We can support them logistically. We can train both military and police forces to do those operations by training them in base camps and by supplying them with, with equipment and resources to, to be more effective in their own operations as they go out in eradication and lab seizures. Are these countries in Latin America welcoming our attention? There was a story um, in the recent past that uh, an effort to establish a Caribbean area task force, a kind of picket line of ships, 
uh, operating somewhere near Colombia, but on the high seas, uh, led to objections and the president decided to withdraw that. Is this a sign that the Latin countries don't want our help or they, that simply they don't want that kind of help? Uh, the Caribbean task force issue was a bit of an aberration because it came very closely on the heels, if you'll recall, of the American action in Panama and sensitivities to the deployment of American forces anywhere in the region uh, were heightened at that time. But we are doing a lot of things in source countries with military resources, not, not necessarily just personnel resources. In fact, to a very great extent, it's other types of resources, equipment and logistics and operational and planning support. But we do all of it that we do down there in those countries, specifically at the request of the host country itself. It's all very coordinated with the U.S. embassies and the host nation military or police forces. So yes, they, they do welcome the support and we're providing it in increasing amounts as they come to us with requests for assistance. One important question that has occurred so far we haven't addressed and the viewers may be confused about this, what exactly do the powers do the American military possess on the high seas or in international airways to stop and search a ship or an airplane? As an example, in the Caribbean on any given day in the past few months, the U.S. Navy will have four or five vessels operating in that entire Caribbean region. But on board each one of those vessels is a Coast Guard law enforcement detachment, what we call a LEDET. And in fact, any time that ship is engaged in operations that would involve contact with a vessel, a vessel of a foreign nation, the law enforcement detachment people are in control of the operation. They would direct then the ship to go and pull alongside the other vessel so that the Coast Guard officers then could direct a search of a vessel, for example. And if the so, other vessel doesn't stop, uh, what are our legal powers or our military capacities in that regard? In that kind of situation, we, the, the Navy vessels would operate under what are known as Coast Guard rules of engagement. The Coast Guard law enforcement detachments could in fact direct warning shots or even disabling shots into a vessel that did not stop after having received proper direction to do so and having involved the procedure where uh, calls are made back, in effect, to the Coast Guard headquarters to get permission to fire those warning or disabling shots. Peter Reuter, uh, in conclusion, if interdiction is limited in your view, where should most of our dollars be spent? Uh, where they, in fact, are being spent, oddly enough, which is at the, um, well, sorry, take it back. I think that we need to build a treatment system that works, a, a treatment system in the public sector that works, and I think that we need to accept the fact that in terms of, of enforcement efforts, it's got to be primarily at the, the street level or the lower levels of the distribution system, and perhaps even uh, using uh, law enforcement against users. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. For Crime File, I'm James Wilson. Crime File is a production of CF Productions Incorporated, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice, research arm of the U.S. Department of Justice.